Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's a special treat to have you with us this afternoon. Welcome to the National Archives. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube station. This afternoon, we'll be talking about American presidents and how the holders of this highest office in the land use their fame as celebrities to further their agendas. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs that will be presented here in the next couple of weeks. Next Tuesday, the 28th, General Ann Dunwoody will be here at noon to talk about her new book, A Higher Standard, Leadership Strategies from America's First Female Four-Star General. A week later at noon on Tuesday, May 5th, Robert Grenier will give us a personal account of the CIA's war in Afghanistan in response to 9-11 when he comes to discuss his book, 88 Days to Kandahar, a CIA, CIA diary. Book signings will follow both programs. To learn more about these and all of our public programs, pick up our copy of our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby, as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it in regular mail or by email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership also out in the lobby. Forty-three men have served as President of the United States, but only some can be considered celebrities. We had a few celebrities in the first half of our history, most notably our first president, war hero and father of our country, George Washington, and the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln. But most of the celebrity presidents have come in the modern era when film, radio, and television fostered a person-to-person -person connection with citizens. Several of these 20th century star presidents are represented in the presidential library system run by the National Archives and Records Administration. Franklin Roosevelt, the larger-than-life chief executive who guided the nation through the Great Depression and World War II, opened the first presidential library in 1941. Since then, every president from Herbert Hoover to George W. Bush has established a library and museum to house the papers of his administration and document his accomplishments. Kenneth T. Walsh is the chief White House correspondent for U.S. News and World Report author of the presidency column for U.S. News and writer of a daily blog called Ken Walch's Washington at usnews.com. Walch is one of the longest serving White House correspondents in history. He served as president of the White House Correspondents Association from 1994 to 1995 and has won the two most prestigious awards for White House coverage, the Aldo Black Beckman Award twice, and the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, three times. Walsh has taught courses at American University on politics and media, media ethics, how the media shape history, and the PR presidency. In addition to his newest book, Celebrity in Chief, he's written seven, seven other books on the presidents and the presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kenneth Walsh. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction, and I want to thank the ar archives for hosting me here. I, uh, being a White House reporter, I have spent much time at the presidential libraries around the country and their wonderful facilities, uh, not only if you're doing research like I do, but also just to put you in touch with the history of our country and the history of the presidents and the history of our times, really, so they're wonderful places to visit. And so I encourage everybody to go there if you can. They're sprinkled all over the country, and you can see many of them uh, in your travels. Um, this is a particularly interesting time for me to give this talk, by the way, because tomorrow is the White House Correspondents Association dinner. Uh, those of you who are from this area, I'm sure, are very well aware of this, but this is the annual dinner that's supposed to celebrate um, the White House press corps and the presidency. Uh, it's become, however, a real spectacle. It's become really a celebrity-driven event in which the president uh, embraces his celebrity. Uh, it's become populated by endless numbers of movie stars and actors and actresses and, and entertainers and sports figures that tend to crowd out the, the journalists. And so you'll read all about it for the next few days. 
I'm a former president of the White House Correspondents Board, and so I ran this dinner one year, so I'm very well aware of what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, but it's really the ultimate intersection of journalism, politics, government, and show business. These days, mostly show business. <laughs> and so we could talk about that a little later, uh, more if you'd like. But it's an interesting uh, occasion to be talking about the presence as celebrities because this is a perfect example of what's happened in our celebrity-driven culture, the takeover of all these different um, sort of government, political, and journalism industries by the celebrity culture. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the celebrity in chief notion, uh, how I came to, uh, to develop it, and look at a little bit of history about our celebrity presence, mostly the presidents who were celebrities, although some of our presidents were not. And I th my point in all this is basically because our culture is so celebrity driven, uh, our presidents need to embrace this notion, participate in celebrity culture, and channel it to accomplish their goals, uh, which President Obama actually has done more than any other president before, and we'll talk about him in a, in a few minutes. But um, the, the notion that uh, pre presidents can no longer participate in popular culture and enhance their own, their own celebrity has really gone by the board because um, presidents have to participate in popular culture. They have to understand it, and they have to use it and use their own fame and celebrity to enhance their own agendas and call attention to themselves in positive ways. This, a lot of people, more traditional folks, don't like this. Uh, they feel it's lowered the stature of the presidency, but nevertheless, this is basically where we are today. Um, as you just heard, our first president was our first celebrity president, the celebrity in chief. There, this is a, a depiction of Washington crossing the Delaware, this heroic figure. And um, we have never had a figure like this before because he was considered the indispensable man, as they called him in those days. He was the fellow who nobody thought anybody could really lead the new country except George Washington. He was a hero of the Revolutionary War. Uh, he, uh, his integrity was beyond reproach. And he understood that he was a celebrity at the time, and he used his celebrity to uh, set precedence for what presidents would do for the rest of the history of our country. Uh, when he was uh, elected, um, this is, as I say, this is a depiction that came later, but it reflects how he was thought of by his country, countrymen and countrywomen. Uh, this is uh, a depiction of Washington approaching New York as he was about to be sworn in. New York was our first uh, residence for the president, the first seat of the, of the government. And, um, Washington made his way from Mount Vernon, Virginia, which is just not very far from here, which you can visit. It's a wonderful place to visit with his estate. Uh, he made his way up north um, to get to New York to be sworn in. And everywhere he went, he was greeted, greeted in those days like a, what a rock star would be today. And this is a depiction of what would happen. They, he'd cross a river, and there'd be vessels all around rowing him across. Uh, uh, artillery salutes would go off. Um, there were, people would crowd the shore. They'd cheer him because he was the, sort of the hero of his time, and as I say, the first celebrity president. Uh, he was uh, when he was sworn in. There was actually an interesting moment because he was actually very nervous about it because he didn't know if he could live up to all this incredible uh, glamour that he was that was attributed to him and all this incredible stardom from the time. But of course, he did, as I say, use his. Um, uh, position as celebrity in chief to set precedence. Um, the idea that the president should only serve two terms, that lasted until Franklin Roosevelt, who broke with that precedence and was elected four times, but for many years people felt, agreed with Washington, two terms would be enough. He, he uh, departed from what people were thinking of as the trappings of royalty. He felt that that's not the way the country should be. So um, he actually rejected a lot of that. Um, at the time they were trying to figure out what do we call the new president, and they came up with all kinds of different titles. One of them that particularly struck me was His High Mightiness and Defender of the Realm. Uh, Washington said, Mr. President will be just fine. And so that's the, what we call our president and have ever since. But Washington, as I say, uh, so set the pace in so many ways. We'll fast forward a little bit here to Lincoln. Uh, one of our iconic presidents. Whenever we have historians do ratings of the presidents, really Washington, Lincoln, and probably Franklin Roosevelt tend to be in the top three in some order. But when Lincoln first ran for president, he was thought to be a frontiersman. 
uh, sort of a guy who maybe wasn't smart enough to be president, a guy who maybe didn't have the uh, sophistication to be president, didn't understand a lot of things. So he understood that this image of being the frontiersman, the rail splitter, as they called him, was something he had to really break away from. And as he was becoming more of a celebrated figure, he had to channel that into more positive ways. This is the whole point I'm trying to make about Celebrity in Chief. So he gave a famous speech in New York at Cooper Union, where he set forth his views about the Union, uh, about slavery, about defending the Union, and so on. And he realized this was going to be a very important moment in his uh, political career. So he decided to have a new picture taken to illustrate this new fellow who was running for president this Abraham Lincoln guy, the rail splitter. And this is the picture that Matthew Brady, a famous Civil War photographer, came up with. Now, the interesting part of it is when you look into this further, Matthew Brady saw this fellow Lincoln walk in, and he thought, he's actually a rather ugly man. Uh, he, you know, We don't want to have a close-up. And if you look at pictures from those days, they were basically head shots, head and shoulders. So Matthew Brady decided, well, I don't want to show people the close-up of this man because he doesn't look very good. He put, plus, he showed up in a, in a wrinkled suit. Uh, his tie was askew and everything, so they had to sort of straighten all that out. So Matthew Brady decided to take the advantage of Lincoln's height and his imposing physical stature to pull the camera back. And this is the picture that he came up with. If you look closely at it also, Lincoln has his hand on a book. That was thought to show erudition, to show the sense that Lincoln was an intelligent man, was an educated man, self-educated. And so this picture was used very widely in that presidential campaign of 1860, which Lincoln won, to show this new fellow from what was thought of as the American West, out west in those days, uh, in Illinois. And of course, he won the election. This picture was used very widely, not only in the campaign, but during his presidency. And in those days, this picture became so famous they use it in different iterations. Lincoln grew a beard, and they did what we think of today as photoshopping. They drew a beard on him, but they kept the picture. Um, then he did have other pictures taken, just as a couple of interesting points here. This is sort of the resolute um, Lincoln who, uh, this is a picture he liked to be used about himself. Um, Lincoln um, had this picture distributed as well. But people always talk about the uh, the strains that the presidency puts on you. Well, this is, this is some terrific pictures sort of before and after. This is when Lincoln first takes over. And then as this is the next picture I'll show you is just before he was assassinated. Now look how much he's changed. Look how gaunt he is. Just as an example of how much stress he was under. This is the first when he took over. This is him just before he died. This is a gaunt spectral figure. Uh, so the public relations with Lincoln could only go so far because the, um, the um, burdens of office were so intense. Now, what really made Lincoln a celebrity in chief and a figure for the ages is he was assassinated. So he was very controversial during his time in office. A lot of people made all kinds of horrible comments about him and so on, uh, saying he was a buffoon, he looked like a gorilla, he was stupid, this sort of thing. But when he was assassinated, and first of all, when the Union clearly won the war, this very greatly enhanced his celebrity. But also, after he was assassinated, he, then he became a figure for the ages. That's when this celebrity notion really took off, and he has become one of our most iconic leaders. And this is the kind of thing that was shown about Lincoln after he died. Here he's being welcomed to heaven by George Washington and some angels. <laughs> so he became this amazing figure in our history. And in the African-American community, because he worked to end slavery uh, and, and uh, led the Union forces in ending the war uh, and freeing the slaves, he became a, a spiritual figure. He was thought of as Father Abraham, a guy you can see just from that title, the sense of spirituality that was invested in him, gave his life <clears throat> for the cause of saving the Union and ending slavery. So he became a tremendously powerful celebrity figure in our history. <clears throat> it's still used by our politicians who feel that he was, in overcoming all the adversity, one of our greatest leaders. <clears throat> now, fast forwarding again, <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was the forerunner of the modern celebrity president. We didn't have the media then as we have today, so I don't give him uh, classify him as the first truly modern president, although he came close. But he was a guy who understood the importance of being a celebrity, uh, the importance of channeling celebrity to his agenda and to himself in positive ways. <clears throat> One of the ways he did that was using his military 
history. Uh, this is him uh, with the Rough Riders. He was a leader of this cavalry unit <coughs> during the Spanish-American War. Uh, they, there was a famous charge up San Juan Hill. Um, he led the charge. He was uh, very bold and daring at the time, and he had this tremendous um, reputation as being this sort of new breed of vigorous leader. You can see him, of course, you see him there in the center of the picture with the suspenders on uh, just below the American flag. This is, he was the leader of this unit, and he took very, very personally, he, he led the unit. He understood the idea of communicating your celebrity, channeling and shaping your celebrity was very important. And he did that through the newspapers of his time. This is before radio and television. Uh, what he did is he understood that, as his distant cousin Franklin Roosevelt would understand later, that a lot of the owners of newspapers didn't like his agenda, his progressive agenda. He took on what he called the malefactors of great wealth, wealthy industrialists, and in some, to some extent, the, the owner class in America. And um, uh, so the publishers of newspapers wouldn't like what he did, but the reporters liked him. So he, he got to know the people who wrote the stories, and that's why he got a lot of positive attention. And he also understood that incidents can illustrate a presidency very, very well. And one famous incident was the teddy bear. And we all know about the teddy bear, what it came from, from, from Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he went out, he was a big game hunter, and he went hunting uh, in, on one occasion, and one of his, he wanted to, catch, to, to hunt a bear, and, and he wasn't being successful. So one evening, one of his guides came in with a baby bear that he had found and trapped, and brought it for the president to shoot. <laughs> and the president, Teddy Roosevelt, said, uh, it's, not, it's not fair game, as they say. He said, I'm not going to do it. So this one account was a let it go and he refused to shoot the teddy bear. And this is a cartoon at the time uh, illustrating that story. It became very, very famous in the United States. And that's then manufacturers started making teddy bears, plush animals for children to play with. But it was named after Teddy Roosevelt, our president. This is the kind of thing that he did, and he welcomed the attention. He also called attention to himself as a celebrity through his conservation efforts. He made many trips out west to the uh, what we now think of as our national parks and uh, preserved areas. This is him at Yosemite with John Muir, the naturalist. And so he was uh, actually, again, using his celebrity to build on his celebrity in positive ways and call attention to his agenda of preserving the natural wonders of the United States, which he did in many cases. So he was actually, like I say, a forerunner of this celebrity that we deal with today in our presidency. Now, Franklin Roosevelt was, I think, the first truly modern president, and he was the first true celebrity president. We see President Obama today with a lot of celebrities and stuff, but this was actually invented by Franklin Roosevelt in many ways. Um, he had Hollywood on his side through his elections from 1932 on, getting more and more intense. Uh, he's, and now Hollywood, of course, is very strongly in favor of the Democratic Party and Democratic presidential nominees. Franklin Roosevelt was a Democrat, and he actually went really far in getting Hollywood on his side. So there's another convergence here between Hollywood and the presidency. This is what he would do. He, Eleanor, you can see Eleanor in the white dress, sort of center left in the photograph of the first lady. And these are some of the most famous stars of the day. Uh, you might not be able to recognize some of them. Remember Laurel and Hardy? Well, Laurel and Hardy are in there. James Cagney is sitting on the right on the lawn. Pat O'Brien is in there. Bob Hope is in there. Uh, there's... Uh, I think Claudette Colbert is in there. So uh, we think of this as a, you know, a contemporary notion, but Franklin Roosevelt understood that he could absorb some of the celebrity from the entertainment world and have it enhance his own presidency, and he did that actually very well. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, of course, had polio. He had, his legs were paralyzed from polio. He never recovered the use of his legs, but he started a tremendous fundraising drive to uh, raise money to research uh, polio and became what they called the March of Dimes. Where people would send in dimes, the coins, to the White House. There was little, these little cards with slots in them that some of you may remember. I can remember from my own boyhood uh, in New York City. Uh, but this was invented under Franklin Roosevelt, became the March of Dimes to raise money for polio. But the celebrity of these Hollywood folks was channeled through that, and it added to the aura of Franklin Roosevelt as well. He understood the importance of uh, image of using his celebrity to build himself up. This is him on the way to a baseball game, 
and you can see he seems to be enjoying himself. He, he uh, loved the crowds and so on, and that's very important for presidents to look like they, they like <laughs> what they're doing, that they like people, that they understand popular culture and they participate in it, and Franklin Roosevelt did this very well uh, in sp with sports and with various other things. He also understood that the new medium of radio very important in those days in communicating with the country. He gave fireside chats to the country. This is a depiction of him giving a fireside chat, which is basically Franklin Roosevelt, the president, talking directly to the United States, trying to reassure the country that we'll get through the Great Depression, later we'll get through World War II, we'll win over the Depression, we'll win in World War II, and his voice became very distinctive. Uh, people welcomed him into their homes by radio, and people, you could walk down, uh, streets all over the country when he was giving a fireside chat and you could hear him and you wouldn't miss a word hearing him through the open windows as the radios were turned on to Franklin Roosevelt in one home after another. So he per perfectly well understood uh, popular culture and the need to communicate and use the popular media of his time to get his point across and to enhance himself as the main celebrity in the United States. He only gave, by the way, um, 30 fireside chats in his 12-year presidency. People tend to think he did them all the time. He didn't. But he understood as a showman that you could wear out your welcome. That's another important thing in presidents being celebrities, that you could go too far. People would not want to hear you if you, if you kept at them all the time. The, the famous actor Orson Welles once had a chat with President Roosevelt, and Roosevelt said to him, you know, there are two truly great actors in America, and you are the other one, he said, <laughs> because Franklin Roosevelt considered himself one of the two best, best actors in America. But I'm not saying that critically. It worked for him. He understood the value of, of public image, and um, this is what he did during his presidency. Now, when Harry Truman came into office, he uh, did not have that same uh, aura that uh, Roosevelt had. This is a famous incident when Harry he was actually vice president at the time. Truman was vice president to Roosevelt for a very short period, and Roosevelt passed away. He gave a speech in Washington, and Lauren Bacall, a famous starlet of the time, decided to get a little publicity for herself. She jumped on the piano when she was playing, just as an impromptu thing. Harry doesn't quite know where he's supposed to be looking here, does he? <laughs> he's not quite sure what he's supposed to be doing. But after this was over, uh, his wife, uh, Beth, said to him, Harry, don't ever do that again. You looked like you were having an entirely too good a time with Lauren Bacall on the piano. So he didn't do that anymore. He tried to communicate with the country in uh, basic ways. Uh, he released pictures of himself, like exercising when he was going one place or another on a naval vessel, but didn't quite work. Uh, initially, he was quite popular in a rally-around effect, but then he never really tapped into... Uh, popular culture as much as he might have, and also the Korean War and problems we were having in the economy at home really, uh, particularly the Korean War, really hurt him badly, and he left office as one of our most unpopular presidents. He has taken on a great luster since then, in retrospect, but at the time, partly because he was not someone who understood popular culture or tried to take advantage of it as a celebrity. He really left office uh, in sort of at a low point. Uh, President Eisenhower succeeded him. He, of course, was a celebrity when he took office. He was the commander of Allied troops in the Normandy invasion and through the, the taking of Europe. So he was worldwide, a worldwide figure. This is him uh, when he was in the military as a general in the Army. Um, by the way, uh, sometimes our presidents do shape the popular culture in different ways. One thing that Eisenhower did, he was not thought of as a guy who was sort of hip, as they say, but he did understand the everyday culture of America, that people wanted what they called a sense of normalcy after the war and after the Depression and so on, so he gave people that. But one thing he popularized was this jacket. <laughs> they called it the Ike jacket, which he wore uh, as his, in his military days and occasionally at the White House. The other thing is that he did is he had a tremendous effect on the sport of golf. I have in my book, I talk about sports and presidents uh, quite a bit because this is another way presidents enhance their celebrities and connect to popular culture. Eisenhower loved to play golf. He, he didn't play golf very well, but he played all the time. He got a lot of criticism for playing too much. This is him with Arnold Palmer when Arnold Palmer was in his prime, famous golfer. And uh, Eisenhower actually wrote an, a public essay in which he extolled golf, saying it's, he wished everybody would play. It was something families could play, fathers, mothers, children. And 
during his presidency, golf took off as a sport. It became a trim, much more popular than it had been. And uh, a lot of that was due to President Eisenhower. But it really wasn't, uh, he really didn't dip into the popular culture nearly as much as his successor did, and that was President Kennedy. President Kennedy uh, really did bring glamour to the White House. He understood that the public wanted this sense of excitement with the presidency, that we were going through a period where our celebrity culture was getting more intense in those days. And he was always fascinated by entertainment culture. His father, Joe Kennedy, was a Hollywood producer. We think of him as a investor in the East Coast, in New York and in Massachusetts, but he was actually a, a producer. He got to know a lot of the entertainment figures at the time, and Jack Kennedy got to know them as well. And he was always interested in how a politician could use the techniques of show business to enhance his own celebrity and his own popularity and channel uh, uh, public attention in a positive way to his agenda. And Kennedy managed to do this. He used his family in many ways. This is the family at Hyannisport. Uh, Jack Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, truly a celebrity couple. The country just loved to learn about them, to know about them. He understood that he had to create an aura of excitement because that was the image he started off with. So he brought his family into that. He was the first president who truly used his family to enhance his image. They were, remember the famous pictures of little John Jr. sitting in the desk under the president's uh, uh, feet, uh, uh, at the president's feet, they had a little slot they could open. The photographer could take the picture of little John sitting there. Famous picture. He also liked to have Caroline, his daughter, come in, and she'd do somersaults and acrobatics in the office, and he'd clap his hands in rhythm, and that picture was released. So he understood that people wanted the president, to, they wanted to know more about the personal side of the presidency, and that was something he did to enhance his celebrity image. Uh, as a family man, even though, as we know, he had a lot of problems in his marriage, uh, but publicly he was portrayed as a family man. He, uh, getting back to that notion of using Hollywood celebrity to enhance a president's luster, Kennedy understood that very well. He became fascinated by some of the main entertainment figures of his time and liked to have them around him. This is Frank Sinatra. Um, who befriended Kennedy, they became very close, and then when Kennedy became aware of some of the sort of mobster connections that Sinatra had, he backed away from Sinatra, but for a while, it was part of this notion of this, this exciting singer, entertainment figure, uh, joining forces with the president, uh, and uh, that's something that Kennedy fully understood. Of course, the height of his connection to celebrity was Marilyn Monroe. Uh, this is the, one of the rare pictures. You remember, you might have seen clips of President Kennedy at a birthday celebration in New York. Thousands of people attended. They used it as a party fundraiser. And Marilyn Monroe showed up and sang, Happy Birthday, Mr. President, wearing the skin-tight dress. And this is the dress. This, this happened just after the performance. And um, uh, Kennedy then got up on stage after Marilyn had sung Happy Birthday, Mr. President, in a very provocative way and said uh, uh, his life was now a success to have Marilyn Monroe sing Happy Birthday in a very innocent and naive way, which is the exact opposite of what she actually did. But so he used this, his connections to Marilyn Monroe to enhance his celebrity as well. So he's a, he's a president who definitely um, you know, was at the apex of our um, celebrity culture at the time. Some other presidents less successful. <laughs> this is the single most requested photograph from the White House, as I understand it. <laughs> this is President Nixon with Elvis. What happened was Elvis uh, was uh, interested in law enforcement. He thought he could help uh, catch, interestingly enough, drug, uh, drug uh, abusers, uh, even though he abused his own medications himself. <laughs> So he thought he'd show up at the White House and see if he could get a, some kind of a law enforcement badge from the president. And he showed up at the Northwest Gate and he said, you know, I'm Elvis Presley. I'd like to see the president. And they, oh, yeah, sure, you're really Elvis Presley. And, uh, but he talked his way in. And at first, Nixon said, I don't want to see Elvis Presley. I don't know, I don't know anything about him. I, I, I'm not connected to this sort of thing. So but his aide said, well, look, it'll be good for you to be connected to this very famous entertainer for the younger generation and so on. So he met Elvis, this is sort of an awkward moment. And at one point, the best thing Nixon could think to say was, that's quite a getup you have on. <laughs> and Elvis said, 
you have your audience and I have mine. <laughs> that was a pretty good answer. Uh, but uh, this, again, this is a very famous picture, but Nixon never was able to really connect with popular culture or with Hollywood. Uh, more successful with sports, by the way, than with other things, but um, he was not uh, a guy who naturally took to this sort of thing. So he's one of the examples in the book of someone who, was, who lost his celebrity and never regained it, because he resigned uh, during the Watergate scandal, which is the subject of a whole other talk. But basically, Nixon is sort of the other side of celebrity culture, the presidents who, who were unable to use it to their advantage. Ronald Reagan. As you can see, I don't have time to do all the presidents, but we'll do sort of what I consider the highlights. Ronald Reagan uh, was a middle-class guy. He uh, was brought up in Illinois. He then became a radio announcer, broadcast sports, baseball, went out to Hollywood and became an actor. And he had played the football in college. And so he, um, went, he understood that there was this new movie going to come out about a guy named George Gipp, who was a running back for the Notre Dame football team. And he said, I could play this role. And I know how to play football. I look like I could be a football player. And he brought these photo photographs to show what he had done. And so then he was hired and he did play the role. And um, this is uh, actually a depiction of the, the publicity um, posters they put out. New Newt Rockney, All-American. Newt Rockney was the coach of Notre Dame. And there's a famous scene in the movie where George Gipp, played by Ronald Reagan, the character is dying in the movie. And uh, the coach comes in and... The Ronald Reagan figure, as George Gipp says, uh, when, the, when things go badly and the boys are down on the team, just ask him to win one more for the Gipper. And this became a, a, a slogan he used for the rest of his political career when he was trying to motivate his supporters, win one more for the Gipper. And it actually worked. He, he was able to motivate people that way. But Reagan was the only president we ever had who was a show business celebrity in his past life. He was... Uh, movie star, he was a television star. We can, we can uh, assess whether he was a good actor or not. Uh, but basically, he was an actor and he was in many movies. He hosted two TV shows, uh, Death Valley Days and General Electric Theater, became very well known around the country as this genial fellow. And this is the role he played for the rest of his life in politics and out of politics the likable, genial guy who uh, had certain principles. Lots of this he played as this kind of figure in his movies, and then he tried to take that into uh, politics, elected governor of California based on this image, and became president. Um, I started covering Reagan uh, when I first started the president, covering the presidency in 1986, and Reagan did master the main medium of his time. You can see that's a thread I'm weaving through this discussion about celebrities in chief. Presidents need to master the media of their time, and he understood that television was the main media. When I started covering the White House almost 30 years ago, it was the broadcast networks. This was before cable, before the 24-hour news cycle, before social media. But Reagan understood that the be-all and end-all for him had to be television. This is where most people got their information from. Every day, he and his staff would come up with something called the line of the day, and they gear everything they did at the White House to that line of the day, a theme, and they came up with wonderful backdrops and images that television could not resist. Even if they wanted to be critical of the president, the images that he showed were uh, these images of this wonderful, uh, genial fellow, this celebrity who was trying his best, sort of an everyday person uh, who was trying to uh, you know, do his best in the presidency. Again, I'm, I'm not being partisan in any ways. This is basically what he did. I leave you to assess whether it was something he should have done or not. But basically, uh, he did become known as uh, a, a great communicator and a guy who did master celebrity culture of his time. And this is sort of an interesting uh, uh, depiction of that. Um, what he did is he, um, he understood that people wanted to feel better about themselves and about the country. And he channeled his celebrity in that way. So these backdrops I mentioned, it was always American flags soldiers, police, um, children, uh, things that sounds very simple, but he understood that people wanted to see that. There was a famous case where Reagan uh, was, um, um, he was, of course, almost assassinated, and um, he then realized he had to show the country that he was able to overcome this and he was recovering well. So they released all kinds of pictures of him working out with weights and so on to show that he was recovering and he was 
still a vigorous uh, leader, even though he was in his 70s at the time, and people had questions about his age, but he managed to get beyond that by using his celebrity and creating these images. He also uh, knew a lot of people in show business, and he brought them into the White House uh, many times. Michael Jackson. I'll show you another picture of Michael Jackson a little bit later, because every president has tried to bring Michael Jackson in his orbit. Where do you see how much Michael Jackson changes in these pictures? But basically, this is, uh, looks, looks, I think, reflected the actual moment, because the Reagans, Nancy and Ronald Reagan, weren't quite sure what to say to Michael Jackson. He doesn't quite seem to know what to say to them. But and I don't think they said much to each other at all. It was just basically a photo opportunity. But he understood that he had to try to connect with show business and popular culture, which he actually did do. So Reagan was an example of the celebrity in chief in its full sort of glory, more or less. Now, Bill Clinton realized early on that he wanted to tap into the, uh, the um, celebrity of the time. And so he managed to go to something called Boys State and Boys Nation. I was actually in Boys State myself years ago. It's basically a high school program for young leaders. And he managed, when that group of Boys Nation kids went to the White House, he managed to get up to the front of the line and shake President Kennedy's hand. This is the young Bill Clinton shaking hands with President Kennedy uh, in order to you know, get into that uh, celebrity culture. I don't, I've always wondered how they managed to, to save this picture all this time, because it did help him in his political life just to have this picture, but uh, maybe he knew something was going to happen in his later life, and he always saved the picture. Uh, he also capitalized on it in, in other ways on his celebrity, been building his celebrity in positive ways. This is a famous time when he was, he was campaigning in 1992, for the Democratic nomination for president, he appeared on the Arsenio Hall show, played the saxophone, and wore shades. This was a big moment at the time. People felt, well, this is actually a hip guy. This, this is a guy who actually understands popular culture. And he used that for his own uh, advantage throughout the campaign and through his presidency. Uh, Clinton was elected. Now, this is Michael Jackson. Now, doesn't he look a bit different there on the left? Uh, he's going through his own transformation. But uh, uh, this is uh, President uh, Clinton uh, uh, being inaugurated at one of his events. And it's Diana Ross, formerly of the Supremes, very much into popular culture, very much into tapping into this sort of thing. And uh, he was constantly energized by people and crowds. Clinton uh, loved to be around people. He still does. Uh, he's, he's one of our most... Uh, uh, biggest celebrities in politics today, even though he's a former president. I'll come back to that in a minute. But he always loved that sort of thing. Uh, of course, he probably loved the, uh, the sort of the self-indulgent part too much because, of course, there was the, uh, the impeachment on the sex and lies scandal that he had. We had to endure that whole investigation and uh, series of votes in Congress on uh, the Monica Lewinsky issue for a whole year. Um, and this is the kind of coverage that it got. So he actually moved from uh, bringing his celebrity into positive areas into being into running a sort of a sordid soap opera. One day after another, one incident that would come out that would make you cringe would make the country cringe. But uh, what Clinton managed to do is he managed to persuade the country that his private life should be kept separately from evaluating him from his public life and his public leadership. And this is the first time a president tried to do that, and he succeeded. By the time he left office, he was popular again. People felt, OK, maybe he's a rascal in his private character, but in his public life, he is a good leader. Today, I, as I say, he's one of the most celebrated political figures in the country and uh, loves that image. We'll have to see how he deals with his wife Hillary's presidential campaign. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now we're up to current times here, President Obama. President Obama, this is the, that uh, famous poster, the Hope and Change poster. He's elected in um, 2008 as the candidate of Hope and Change. He, uh, more than any other president, has capitalized on popular culture, has brought popular culture into the White House, has participated in it in many, many ways. This is him on election night uh, when he was first, he first won. It, it's gotten more and more intense. Look how, how much the, the daughters, look how much younger they look here in this picture. Now they're young, young, young women. But um, he's also, he's done all kinds of things that, as I say, people felt uh, initially, that he was lowering the stature of the presidency. He played, goes out and plays pool to show he's an everyday guy. He goes on uh, a lot of TV shows that uh, other presidents would not do in, as president. Um, uh, he would um, uh, participate in social media. They have a whole White House 
um, website that's very active. Millions and millions of people get in, in information directly from the White House. Maybe some of you do. They have their own basically network to communicate with the country and to participate in popular culture that way. Some of the shows he does, other presidents would not dream of doing. This is the Between Two Ferns show with Zach Galifianakis. Um, this is a show that's very popular with young people in which it's a sort of a parody show. Uh, Zach Galifianakis it tries to embarrass and insult his guests, but President Obama understood this was coming, so he insulted the host back, <laughs> and he played. He actually did it very well, and he managed to use the occasion to convince young people to sign up for his health care program, which they actually did. So it actually worked pretty well for him in participating in this kind of show. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, one star after another, uh, President Obama has associated with them. They've endorsed him. And so he has really come in contact with public, uh, pop popular culture very, very intensely, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, I, again, as I say, presidents um, in the past were thought to be um, d endangering themselves if they participated too much in popular culture because they were lowering the stature of the presidency. No more. President Obama knows exactly who he needs to appeal to. He has brilliant pollsters who can slice and dice the electorate. He knows the shows he should go on to, to communicate with different parts of the electorate. And I think from now on, every president is going to have to do this, whether they like to do it or not. They're going to have to find where the voters are, how to communicate with them, how to use their celebrity to communicate with different segments of the electorate, as Obama has done. I know a lot of more traditional-minded audiences sort of uh, are not happy to hear that, but I think this is what's going to have to happen. It's partly what Mitt Romney did wrong the last time. He was not seen as a guy who could harness his celebrity culture and use it in, uh, in uh, positive ways. President Obama did, and I think that's going to have to happen. I, I, I can't go into too much about the current campaign, but I'll just wind up with a few thoughts about looking forward on the presidential campaign. We have uh, two incredible celebrity <laughs> candidates out there. Hillary Clinton, this is a picture of Hillary Clinton when she was at Yale Law School. Uh, my house, she's changed, <laughs> haven't we all? Uh, but uh, she always felt that she was going to be a leader of her generation, particularly of women. She would be the, lead, the leading change figure in, uh, for, for feminism and for women. And she's seeing that come out in her campaign again now. Um, she uh, was recognized in many cases as, what, as this magazine cover says, a superstar, uh, probably the most famous woman in the world. What uh, Hillary Clinton has to do is harness that celebrity and channel it in popular, in, in, in positive ways. She has the Bill Clinton connection. Is she going to try to connect herself with her husband's presidency? Again, this is the first time we've had a celebrity couple running for president. In 1992, when he ran and won, the slogan was, buy one, get one free with Hillary and Bill. Now it's reversed, but it's still the same pattern. If you elect Hillary, you're going to get Bill. And uh, I'll let you decide whether that's good or bad. But basically, they are the first celebrity couple, and they have to learn how to channel that in positive ways. She's also connected, of course, to President Obama, who was his Secretary of State. So she's connected to the celebrity presidency in that way, too. Again, uh, if you, any of you saw the, some of the coverage that she had in her first, this is her second week since she announced her uh, campaign, um, she just draws attention constantly. Everything she does is just devoured by the media, the mainstream media, social media, everything. And so she is very much in the public eye and has to figure out a way to use that to her advantage because her celebrity is really so intense. And of course, this is when she ran for president the last time. Uh, she was unable to harness the celebrity in, in enough positive ways and sort of lost the nomination to Barack Obama in 2008. So now she's trying again. The other celebrity, another sort of dynastic element here is Jeb Bush. Um, I was thinking of showing you pictures of all the candidates for president for Republicans, but it would take me another half hour because there's 19 of them. So I couldn't really do that in this limited time. But this is uh, the perfect illustration on the Republican side of the celebrity issue. For Jeb Bush, this is when he was governor of Florida for two terms. Uh, this is him now. He's trying to harness that celebrity and use it to, for positive effects. He has an interesting dynamic because he is the son of a president and the brother of a former president. This is the, these are the Bush boys. Bush the father, Bush George W. Bush the son, and then Jeb, who wants to be the third Bush 
to be president within basically a generation. Uh, so he has to actually build up his celebrity. He's been out of the public eye for uh, 12 years or so now. Uh, he hasn't run for anything in that time. So he, has, he knows that all the attention is going to be on him when he announces and gets in the race, and he has to figure out a way to deal with that in positive ways. We don't know how he'll do that, but that's going to be his big challenge as Hillary Clinton is sort of the celebrity figure on the Democratic side. Jeb Bush is the celebrity figure on the Republican side. For the other candidates, there's this uh, notion that the, uh, they have to build up their celebrity in positive ways and channel it in positive ways. Um, Jeb Bush has the celebrity because of his family name and um, really has to figure out a way to use that to his advantage. And of course, this is my final thought here. This is the White House. This is where they're trying to get, is basically that uh, presidents in our celebrity culture have to really uh, uh, understand the popular culture, how to participate in it, and uh, use it to their advantage. Uh, if you look at our most effective presidents, they have learned to do that. Our le least effective presidents do not do that very well. And so, so who is elected in 2016 and how successful that president is, is a lot of it's going to depend on using this role of celebrity in chief, and we'll see how that turns out. So with that, I'd be glad to answer some questions for, for we have some microphones here if anybody wants to step up. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the Hillary is attracting some attention from Bill's finances. Um, could you discuss how former presidents have done financially after leaving? Where does Bill fall in the, in the income pool? Right. That, that's a good question. Now, what's happening, and I think you heard the question, but basically... Uh, there's a, this big controversy now uh, about, it's come out in a number of ways. The most recent is this, this, uh, these allegations about money being collected from foreign countries, many of which do not have good human rights or women's rights records, channeling the money to the Clinton Foundation. Uh, and the allegation is that some of these uh, countries and some uh, private industry folks have gotten favorable rulings from the State Department and the government because the money has flown, as, as, uh, has uh, flowed uh, to the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton, this is still being sorted out. Uh, Hillary Clinton says that uh, this is misunderstood, that first of all, the foundation does great work, charitable work around the world, so they're putting the money to good, of, good use, and also that there's never been a quid pro quo. In other words, because you give money doesn't mean you're going to get favorable attention from the Clintons. That has, all has to be sorted out, as I say, but that's the essence of the controversy. As far as um, how much money they've made, um, Cl uh, Hillary Clinton said in an interview some time ago that when they left the White House, they were, they were broke. Well, uh, they didn't, certainly weren't making a lot of money then, but basically it, was only, it, was, it took a very short time. This was very easily anticipated. They then, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, uh, well, particularly Bill, was making hundreds of thousand dollars per speech. He's made uh, about $140 million uh, since he left the office. You can imagine how much money he makes from speeches. And so uh, presidents do tend to be able to use their fame and notoriety to make money after they leave office. Um, many presidents are rich when they get in office, and so they have wealth in their families. Um, another president who got into trouble for this was Gerald Ford, who gave many speeches for a lot of money after he left office because he was not a wealthy man. So he took a lot of criticism for that. So th I think the main point is presidents, when they leave office, can make a lot of money from speeches and other corporate boards and so on, which Gerald Ford also did. But basically, uh, they, they have to understand how bad that might look if they look like they're capitalizing on the presidency to make money for themselves. Uh, this is the problem that Hillary and Bill Clinton are having right now. Yes. Thanks again for your talk. Uh, I guess I was curious if you focus in your book a lot on, uh, I guess, the younger generation, how younger people have made uh, these presidents, celebrities in chief, maybe particularly with uh, the rise of the internet and Obama and his campaign through the internet and also through how opponents will try to, uh, I guess, perhaps uh, make fun of his connection to celebrities right. and it may backfire. I remember the infamous uh, Paris Hilton commercial that kind of backfired and helped Obama, it seemed like, more than it hurt him. Right. Well, I, that's not a good question. Um, the, uh, President Obama has really taken this notion of bringing young people into his uh, orbit uh, more than other presidents have done. 
uh, one of the pillars of his election and re-election were young people and new voters, in addition to women, um, African Americans, Latinos. Young people were very, very important, uh, gave him enormous support, and he understood that he had to communicate directly with them. That's partly why he's doing a lot of these rather unorthodox or unusual television shows and interviews. He's just gave interviews to what they called YouTube personalities, including Zo Glozell and various other people who presidents would never have gotten within a, a mile of in the past, but he understands that they have their own uh, audiences, particularly young people, and he communicates directly with them. So I think, that, and that has worked for him. He has taken criticism for this. I think you alluded to that too, in the uh, particularly in the 2008 and and his uh, re-election campaign, the Republicans <clears throat> said um, President uh, Barack Obama is uh, the most famous celebrity in the world. What good has it done any of you? Well. People actually liked it, as it turned out, and um, they liked the idea that he was famous and that he was using his celebrity and connecting with people that way. So it actually worked for Barack Obama, but he's very good at it. The presidents in the future have to learn to be good at it and make it work for them. Yes. I'd like to ask you about the celebrity aspect. You showed the South Lawn photo of uh, the Roosevelt's with many stars. I don't know if that was kind of the starting of it. You mentioned something in, in your topic about that. But what was the connection with Hollywood? Obviously, it's a PR opportunity for both sides. Was it more than that? Uh, I don't know, from a business aspect or what, what else? was? Why was everybody being invited? Obviously, they were going to go. But the, the other aspects, if you have any knowledge on that. Well, that's another good question. Uh, basically, what happened under Frank and Roosevelt is that the, the entertainment industry became very important to the country. People had to uh, get relief from the terrible economy we had from World War II, so they did that by using entertainment. And uh, Roosevelt understood that, and he understood also that people wanted um, uh, the president to be an entertainer, and that's another important factor to consider in all this, too. The presidents have to be somewhat entertainers now. Again, traditional people, traditional historians uh, are not happy about this, but presidents have to understand that. And so, as I said, he, in that Orson Welles anecdote, he did understand this. Uh, but um, at the time, uh, Hollywood was becoming very important to the country, and he realized that he, Franklin Roosevelt realized that if he could connect to Hollywood, and if they endorsed him, that he could get attention for people in positive ways. On the other side, the Hollywood folks realized that Roosevelt was becoming this, this iconic figure in the country, and they wanted to absorb some of his aura also. So that's why you had, you had these scores and scores of celebrities showing up at the White House, fundraising for the, the polio campaign, supporting Roosevelt's re-election. He actually had huge rallies in which many Hollywood celebrities showed up, uh, very famous people at the time, and endorsed him. So it was sort of a synergy uh, created by the rise of Hollywood and the entertainment industry, the reliance of the country on the entertainment industry, and the desire to know more about these people, because it made people sort of escape their difficult world at the time, and Roosevelt understanding all this and being a very ingratiating figure himself and knowing he could capitalize on Hollywood celebrity uh, and enhance his own reputation. So that's basically the short version. Yes, sir. Um, I, one of the issues that this uh, talk brings up is, I think, uh, a, a, a deeper issue, the, the issue of uh, the connection between celebrity, popular culture, and politics as such. And I, I was wondering if during this uh, study you were wondering or you looked at the, I mean, you talk about looking a little bit at the negative side of it, right? And uh, I had a, a political science professor who thought that Carter lose his uh, re-election campaign the moment he walked down, right? He walked down the, uh, the avenue on his election, that he became too popular and that people weren't going to take him seriously. But the problem is, obviously, if you're going to be a celebrity, that to a certain extent, uh, it would suggest a certain type of politics. It would suggest, uh, you know, moving away from certain at it from, from maybe certain more problematical aspects, and I was wondering if you believe this growing celebrity uh, aspect of the politics is a direct consequence of, you know, Bell talked in the 1950s about uh, the uh, the de ideologization of American politics. Right, politics was becoming less and less about ideology, uh, less and less about class, and all these different issues. I was wondering 
if, um, if you see some of that in, in, in this going on, the demobilization, depolitization of the population. So that's the first part. And with Obama, obviously, being the first black man as a president, um, is there any proof that he only chooses certain type of celebrities, certain type of African-American celebrities, while maybe distancing himself from others who may be more politically conscious or problematical, et cetera, et cetera, to, in essence, enhance his celebrity with, you know, with a dominant population that right. may be still somewhat cynical of him. Thank okay. you. Well, the, the, um, uh, the, the, particularly the second part, I'm not quite sure about your first question, but I think uh, it, it has to do with sort of how, the genesis of all this, but it's related to the second one also. But uh, what President Obama has done is he and Michelle Obama have made a, a point of saying they want the White House to be a place where every American will feel welcome, particularly African-Americans, and they, are, of course, are African-American. So if you look at the events that they've had at the White House, many, many of the entertainers have an African-American. Uh, many of the people on the stage when the president talks, when the president gives a, a, uh, an address or, or is, is at one of these entertainment events, are African-American. And I think that's all intentional. It's designed to... Uh, you mentioned the sort of the wider America and how much this plays into them. Well, what they're trying to do is to, in, in subtle ways and in not so subtle ways, in ways that they don't talk about a lot, is, is bring uh, African American entertainers and sports figures into the wider American family to expose Americans to these folks. And you see that again and again at the White House. And um, um, the, uh, and by the way, the, the whole sports thing is very important too. I have a whole chapter in the book on sports because uh, Americans are such a s so sports oriented and presidents have understood this very well, particularly President Obama. He tries to link himself with sports constantly. This week he had the uh, New England Patriots in, he had a Nat the NASCAR champions in, and he had the Ohio State college football team in. Uh, he's doing that more and more all the time just to capture some of that luster to show he is a sports fan, sort of an everyday guy to connect particularly to male sports fans. And he's doing that uh, day in and day out. The other thing he's done is he, he makes a big deal every year of picking the college brackets in the uh, college basketball tournament. Um, generally doesn't do very well at it, by the way, but, but who does? Uh, but uh, basically, uh, so that's another way he's trying to bond in a broader way with everyday people is through sports. Um, so anyway, I hope I addressed your question. Yes. I wanted to ask if it's become the nature of democracy that style now inevitably trumps uh, substance. Imagine a runoff election between Elizabeth Warren and, let's say, Tom Hanks. Right. <laughs> well, okay, well... Uh, I was going to say Elizabeth Warren and Tom Selleck because they're on different sides of the uh, political fence. But no, I think style has overcome it. And I think that uh, when I first started covering the White House in 1986, so Reagan had a lot of style and, and, and really substance, but there were things that he was unwilling to do. Uh, now, President, particularly President Obama, is much more willing to, to be the style president if he has to, if he can communicate with people that way. Um, he, um, he's commented on... Uh, wearing uh, sort of dad jeans and say, you know, how do I look in them, that sort of thing. You remember Bill Clinton tried some of this when he was asked what kind of underwear he wore, boxers or briefs. It didn't work out too well for him. So President Obama is a little bit more s sensitive and sophisticated in, in the world of style, but style has become very, very important, and that's part of celebrity culture, and the Obamas understand that, and, and, on, and they let it know the music they like, the television shows they like, the movies they like. That was another uh, perfect example when Michelle Obama presented the Oscar for Best Picture two years ago. Uh, that is another interesting intersection between you know, style and, and politics and government and show business. But this is what the Obamas have discovered, that the country likes this. And I think that helps him in difficult times because he, he, people feel that they like the guy and uh, he tries to understand them. He tries to, to be a celebrity as an everyman and that does help President Obama because he's very good at it. Okay, I guess we're, we're out of time. Uh, so anyway, I wanna thank you very much. I have books I'll be signing uh, outside and uh, thank you all for coming and have a great day here in Washington, thank you.
Thank you. My water here. 